Hello and welcome to The Promised Land, a show about Manchester United and part of the 90 Min Podcast Network. I'm Scott Saunders, joined by Rob Blanchett. As per usual, we've had a little break, but we are now back after Man United get beat 1-1 by Brentford in possibly the worst <laughs> performance in club history. Uh, but Rob has just been spouting about it for about 30 minutes before we started recording. Yeah, and I, I have to do that, Scott, obviously, because when we record, I have to be professional and not use expletives. And obviously, I used quite a few expletives, didn't I, in that kind of 20 or 30 minutes spell when we're doing some pre-production for the show. But um, yeah, we're going to have to talk today about why United are bad, where we're going. We don't want it to be a negative show, as always. We try and say, don't get too high, don't get too low. But my God, that Brentford performance yeah, feels like we're hitting new lows sometimes. Apologies if uh, the sound is a little bit different to what it usually is, but I promise this is only for the one show. Just uh, moving into a new studio at Nighty Min Towers, which is uh, causing some temporary issues. But uh, we're back. Please subscribe on Apple and Spotify to our audio show and give us a five-star review. Watch us on YouTube where you can like the stream, subscribe, and leave a comment for us as well. Hit the notification bell so you never miss a show and follow us on social at double underscore Scott Saunders, at underscore Rob underscore P, and at TPL MUFC. And uh, we'll get into the Brentford game a bit today. I know some time has passed since that has actually happened, but obviously the Man United world has been imploding because bad performance after good showing equals world is melting down again and if they go and do what they did against Liverpool two weeks ago or three weeks ago on Sunday which I think is is looking unlikely based on the last performance but we'll just you say don't get too high don't get too low Rob but sometimes it's uh wow we're really high and then other times it's wow we're really low uh, yeah. and it just feels like game to game that's just how it is at the moment it's one day back the manager the next day the manager's getting sacked so um yeah, we'll talk about the Brentford game. We'll look ahead a bit to Chelsea because they uh, tripped the Stamford Bridge on Thursday night before that Liverpool game. And uh, Jason Wilcox as well has resigned from Southampton. Looks to be on his way to Manchester United. We'll talk about that a little bit as well. Dan Ashworth potentially might have to wait for him a little bit. Mm. Uh, but Jason Wilcox might be in first by the looks of it. But right, Rob. So the floor is yours on, uh, on Brentford. I'll, I will let you guys know uh, I was on a flight during this game and I checked my Twitter feed when I got Wi-Fi or when I got 4G or 5G and I landed and my stream was uh, like tweets was just this is the worst thing I've ever seen this is the worst thing I've ever seen and obviously I saw the score I, I laughed and chuckled at the fact that United scored in the 96th minute and Mason Mount was the goal scorer. And then within two minutes, they conceded an equaliser. I laughed at that. And I know how bad it was. Uh, enough people have told me. And Rob is going to tell me again, tell you again how bad it was. Uh, but I did not go back and watch the 90. I've got better things to do. Uh, but Rob, <laughs> you sat there and watched it um, and wanted to tear your beard off, I'm guessing. And tear all my hair out that, that I haven't got. Um yeah, look, I, I think what we have to look at this now, Scott, it's kind of, we get to the end of the season, end of the campaign, and we have to now put it all into context because one of the things that we've said all year long is that, oh, we've got lots of injuries. Oh, we're getting towards the end of the campaign. Oh, we're still in the Champions League slots. Can we get there? Can we not get there? Will fifth get there? Will fourth get there? I think now we have to kind of put all of that aside because Eric's had another year. Yeah, we're nearly at the end of that season. And of course, the other massive change, and we'll talk about, Jason Wilcox today, is what's going on behind the scenes at Man United. So meshing all that together and looking at Brentford, then maybe comparing it to the 4-0 loss at Brentford when we went there at the start of Eric's first season in charge. Yes, you're right. Obviously, Twitter's going to get very upset with performances like that. But we're getting to the point, Scott, where I don't think there is any excuse for a lot of the stuff we're now seeing, especially tactically especially tactically, is that the manager, as much as we want him to succeed, has not got answers for a lot of the problems that are happening in his football team. I mean, just go over the game. First half was bad. You know, I think, you know, you, 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 it's, it's the kind of first half we've all seen a million times, Scott, like United haven't played well and didn't look like they were at the races and 
suddenly within five minutes of the game starting, Liverpool beating them 4-3 just ebbed away. It's like, well, that didn't really happen anymore. That was a cup game and this is real life. I think in the second half, you expected things to get better. And I think United did get some a modicum of control, but it felt like it was all Brentford. And the stats support that, you know, Brentford had 85 touches in Man United's box, which is kind of a new a new era record for us. I mean, look at the teams that have done that in the past. You really don't expect that at Brentford. Like, you don't expect 85 touches in your box. You have to be really bad defensively for that to happen. Um, but that's where we were. And it felt like Brentford were going to win the game pretty much for 90 minutes. It really did. And I didn't know how it's still nil-nil. So we made some mount scores and you get that moment. You know, that should just fuel the team. And it did for like, you know, like Mason Mount slid over to the woods, United fans, and the players were going mad and the United fans were going mad. And I was sat there and I was just thinking, still probably going to concede here because we always do. We score and then concede almost all the time. And the goal itself, Scott, I know you were in the air, but have you seen the goal, obviously? The, the goal? I mean, and what course, was it? Yeah, I've seen, I've seen the three-minute highlight package that Sky Sports put together. And that's what um, we needed. Yeah, and that's all. That's all I needed. I did not need to go and see this. Um... No, and 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 the ball <laughs> looped into the box over the back from deep in the ninety-six minute is very defendable. United are out of shape. Wambasaka's in the wrong position. Um, Martinez has been on the pitch a little while. I think um, obviously because of Victor Lindelof getting an early injury, so he'd he'd had he'd had minutes on the pitch. He's completely out of the wrong space. Casemiro's uh, again in the wrong place. And you look at it, and the ball bounces to Tony, and Tony's like, "I'm going to take six touches because I can, because no one's near me, and then I'm going to slide it across and they score." And it was just a horrible goal, Scott. You had like eight players in your six-yard box, eight Man United players, and not one of them could get near the ball. And it was just like... And it felt worse than the defeat. So in that moment, you kind of go, I really wish we'd just drawn nil-nil and it, we could just say today, oh, we had a bad performance, but we got draws. Not bad. But you're one nil up. You can't defend in these last moments of games. And some of the chat afterwards, Scott, was uh, Eric Ten Hag and some of the, the things uh, questions are being asked was that supposedly when United went one and up after 93 minutes, that he was trying to get messages to players on the pitch to do different things, but no one was listening. This is what we've heard. It didn't look like it. Didn't look like there was any messages going around. Didn't look like the, 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 the from the, the dugout there was any new instructions. It was all very just placid and just, right, right, let's just defend. They haven't got any tactics, Scott, for these moments. You know, you know, they don't know how to shut games down. We've seen it all season long. We've seen it for a year. We're now going to have to start talking about Eric Ten Hag, Scott, in the context of a whole season because we're pretty much at the end of the campaign, aren't we? Nine games left or whatever it is. Um, and it's not getting better. Like, it's if anything, it's getting worse. I know that some of you listen to this are probably dying for me to go and say, get him out, get him out. Um, and you're probably cursing. <laughs> well, I don't know. Maybe, maybe you don't care. But, oh, it's convenient that Scott missed this one, isn't it? Um, <laughs> Scott's um, missed the rest of the season because <laughs> he was in the air for six months. But hey, I, I, I mean, I, I have said a few weeks ago that look, if you're getting your players back, I, I know, who's, I know who's back. Mason Mount's back. Mm. Leicester came back. Um, Casemiro's back. You know, there's a couple of other issues like Luke Shaw. Yeah, but you know, you have to deal with some injuries. But I have said, as much as I have defended Ten Hag for the course of the last eighteen months plus. You know, we need to see better in these last in this last block of fixtures. We need to see better than what we've seen this season. Yeah. And I, I have gone on record and said, look, we need to see improvements. We need to see identity. We need to see cohesion. We need to see results as well. Like top four, top five, you know, maybe it makes a difference. But at, at the end of the day, I think every time United go within a few points of it or close the gap, they haven't shown themselves capable of, uh, con uh, you know, capitalizing on the momentum mm. that they've created. And obviously, yeah. one of the biggest wins under Eric Ten Hag came before the international break against Liverpool. Mm. And it's so expected. I was not surprised at all to see that this is the way that the game went, um, yeah, because cool. that's what that's what this United do. Um, and also, uh, maybe we'll talk about Mason Mount in a little while. But mm. you know, I I've come away from it not angry or whatever maybe if i watched it like in full i would have been but i'm just kind of like looking at it and thinking it's just 
it's so bad it's funny uh mason mounts had the the one probably the worst season of his career you know got a big move hasn't been able to play football when he's been on the pitch he's not really fit into the system long season comes back from injury gets a goal in the 94th 95th minute to think oh finally like things can be turning around for me and the habit that United just have and they can't shrug off of conceding within two minutes of scoring a goal from a cutback, nonetheless. I know. Uh, it's just, you know, I'm trying to laugh it off. Let's just, let's just, let's just say that. But, you know, there, there's more games coming up. Chelsea away. I know Chelsea are awful as well, but that, what a game that's going to be. Good God. That's going to be, I think I'll, I might be there as well. Good God. Like watching that up close. And then Liverpool at the weekend. It's not going to be pretty, but then it wouldn't surprise you if they turned around and did something positive this time. And, you know, but nevertheless, you've got to be better than what, what we saw at the weekend. And yeah, the, the, it'll fall on Ten Hag. It really will. If, if this level of performance continues consistently and United don't climb any higher than sixth, the manager can't have any complaints. And I can't have any complaints either. No, and, and and this is it. And as I said, we, we have to keep reiterating our original position that we, we want Eric to su- succeed. We we backed him from the beginning. He was the manager I wanted. You know, it's just repeating stuff from, from old. But you have to look at the fresh evidence and what, what United are doing today and what you expect tomorrow and where they are in the league table. And this is why I've actually kind of pushed against that and said, I don't really look at United and think too much about the league table because these are fundamentals. These are things you need to get right on the training ground. And if you get them right, then, then then the results come and then your league position goes up. That's just the way I look at these things. You're trying to actually make this more logical but you look at what they're doing, Scott, and their kind of on-field tactics, both on-ball and off-ball, are ridiculous. And this manager hasn't got a clue how to change it in games. And that's where it's changed radically for me. Is that In season one, he was really good at that. We said that as well, that he was good at changing stuff. Now, if you look at the, the Brentford game, say you win it 1-0, people, what do people say? They go, oh, you brought Mason Mount on. That was a good change. And I think Mason Mount took his goal brilliantly, Scott. Like, really did. Like, Casemiro came on and did a no-look pass, fed in, uh, fed in Mason Mount, takes a touch and buries it comprehensively. And you think, yeah, that's that's what Mason Mount could do at his best. Just before that as well, Scott, for the Brentford goal, Mason Mount makes a really, really good defensive header in the box. And he clears it about 60 yards. Like, it's really good. It's like what you want a midfielder to do in that moment. And then Brentford just launch it into the air, into the sky, over the top. And no one reacts, just they're all watching it. And you're like, so So Eric said at the end of the game as well, we'll talk about that, it's about the defence. And there was a quote that obviously went round and I think it's quite damning. You know, he was asked again about his defence and why it's so bad. And do, does he care that the defence is so bad? It was kind of put to him like that. And he paraphrasing said, no, I don't care as long as we win games. But unfortunately, that answer does not wash at this point of the season when your team is this bad. You have to have answers. You've got to tell people what your answers are. You can't just say, I don't care, I just need to win. Because you're not winning and you're playing badly. And eventually you will run out of time. And that's it. You'll get to the end of the season. These seven, eight, nine, ten games will go and expire, Scott. And I think he could even do a Van Gaal and win the FA Cup and be sacked. Like you could, you could, you could be in that scenario because it is so bad, the stuff we're watching. It's not good. And and I also don't feel, Scott, that this is like classic examples of the past where the players have down tools to, and the manager's gone. I think the players are trying. I just don't think anyone has a clue what the tactics are. I watch it and I haven't got a clue. He's also said, obviously, United are one of the highest... Te- are they the highest team in Europe for shots conceded? Or they're, they're, they're in definitely... the top three. Luton yeah, are worse than us and Sheffield United. That's it. Great company. Fantastic company. Relegation um, teams, eh? All three of them. Uh, he's he's also said that obviously those shots are not high quality chances or whatever. That yeah. like I know that the XG against Brentford was bad, um, but that that's been his defense on you know the amount of shots that United are giving up. They're not high quality chances. Yeah. You know that a lot of them are shots from outside the box with players behind the ball. Mm. Um, but that chasm of a gap in midfield has been there that for players to just waltz on through with the ball mm. uh, for most of the season. All of the season, actually. And we've not seen any answers for it. Yeah. Um, And yeah, I mean, he's he's right in a sense. But at the same time, if if you're stressing out who's watching, (laughs) 
you know, so consistently and your players are having to cover so much ground in the midfield and ultimately failing to cover the space that's that's there because of your tactics, then mm. it's uh it's another check mark against against his name. Um yeah, I, obviously <laughs> it's just so crazy, isn't it? How United can go from one extreme to another, although we we do see a lot of uh, tactical consistencies uh, with the amount of space that they give up. There was a large chunk of the game against Liverpool before the international break that United were getting killed for, mm. uh, but they managed to pull it out of the bag. But, you know, the, the question has always been, can Ten Hag do enough in the last few weeks of the season to justify him keeping his job into next season because you've got new owners, you've got a new technical director on his way and you've got a new sporting director coming in at some point, you've got a new CEO and other managers out there who are looking for jobs. A lot of big clubs are doing some movements with their manage with managers. Will United join that party? I mean, it's uh, it wouldn't surprise you at this point, was it? Would it? It really wouldn't. Um, but you know, we say this now. Could things turn around? It's it's such a roller coaster. It's it's just really weird. Really yeah. Weird. It's in my pre-production notes I did this morning, kind of looking at the show. I was thinking, like, what angles can we look at this and kind of not just to make it interesting, but just to say something a little bit different. Well, kind of, there's two things there off the back of what you just said. Uh, I was looking at. I was thinking about pre-season. That's you know when we were on the pre-season tour out there in Las in Las Vegas and we were watching the team and all of this. And I remember coming away from pre-season a little bit, a bit down in the tooth with the football. It's like, well, I didn't really see a team trying to develop things, an idea, you know, like there's issues in midfield. We've got all these problems. Yeah. There's injuries here, there and everywhere. Oh, Cobby's injured. So we can't see him. So there are reasons for some of that, Scott, but I feel about a lot of the tactics, like I felt in preseason before the season even began is that they are, they, whatever the idea is that Eric Ten Hag has does, has not translated from the moment almost Scott, that they won the league cup last year. So from the League Cup winning last year to this point now, so that's a long time, isn't it? That's, that's a really long time. It's over, it's over a year now. It's a, it's a 12-month window. It's a big months, period of time. Even. 12 months in football is like a, it's a, like a light year, isn't it? It's, it's a long time. And in that period of time, they are less organised, more dysfunctional in midfield, more dysfunctional on the ball. They are worse at the press. They had a big part of the season when, obviously, with Hoyland, obviously trying to get him into the game, scoring goals. Rashford's had a disastrous season. You know, you look at individuals. Onana is like now becoming looking like a success story after earlier in the season being blamed for a lot of the problems. And you look across the team, Scott. Whatever Eric is trying to get this lot to do, I don't think it's a can't do or won't do. I just think no one knows. So I think when you get to that point, that was that was like Mark one on there. And then my other pre-production notes here, I was thinking about Jason Wilcox and what's Jason Wilcox going to say to Omar Barada on day one and what's what's Dan Ashworth thinking and what's Sir Jim Ratcliffe thinking with Dave Brailsford. And the question, if it's just a question of do you sack this manager or do you stick with him? Just that, that one question. And if I'm them at the moment, I'm sacking the manager, unfortunately. And, and that's, that's not actually a personal thing on him. It's not about whether he could be a great manager in the future or what he was in the past or what he did at Ajax or all of that, it's what's going on now. And in the business of winning football matches and putting a team out, if I'm looking at that as, as them, I can't sit on my hands. I can't sit there and go, well, I'm making all these changes upstairs, but yet here we are and 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 yet it's the same stuff. So what we do, what are you doing, Eric? Like that's the question I'd be asking him, Eric. What? Why is your team doing this, and why are you doing that with your tactics? So I think you get to the end of the season, Scott. You run out, and these performances do not dramatically improve in nine games. At eight games, we're running out of time now. It doesn't matter if you win the FA Cup; you're going to get sacked, just like Van Gaal. Similar kind of situation. So I just don't like the tactics, Scott. I think there's four one four one long ball from the back. Bruno hitting balls sixty yards. Anana now is now like our main assister hitting the ball in the channel. That's all they've got. They haven't got anything else. That's damning, isn't it, after a year of developing a squad. Yeah, they've been injuries, Scott, but come on. There have been injuries, but that's clearing. And he's running out of excuses. There's, well, in fact, there's no excuses. Yeah. Uh, and, you and know, out of time. He's, he's got what Ten Hag has got to do is give the new owners a really difficult decision to make. 
Mm. He's got to play football and show what he wants to do and show that that aligns with the vision that they're going to want to play. Yeah. You know, because I think we know we know what good football looks like, obviously. Of course we uh, do. Maybe there's like different things in terms of how much possession you keep versus how direct you go, uh, how, how counter-attacking you are. Mm. But Ten Hag has to do enough. He has to give Ineos a problem. If if they sat if they aren't if they decide to sack him and there's a fan revolt against that decision because Ten Hag has done some good work, mm. you know that's a problem that Ineos don't want to bring on themselves. What he's doing at the moment is making it really easy to Definitely. justify that decision being made. Definitely, that he's making it easy to be sacked, and that's why I'm sat there like. And and again, someone who's backed him for a long, long period of time, you, you do end up running out of patience with managers. But the only time I ever really run out of patience with a manager is when it's a tactical thing that keeps keeps reoccurring over and over again. Because that's all the manager's really got. He's the guy that trains the the team and has to whatever idea he's got in his head, he has to translate that into football results. That's how it works. So I, I think the things of Eric, you know, with the game. Scott at the weekend where, where City played Arsenal, right? And it was dull as dishwater, wasn't it? It was dull. It was boring. It was really wasn't a great football. It wasn't a great advert for the Premier League. But that's what two serious teams do who are going for the championship. They cancel each other out and they they play that style of football. Man United used to do that in years gone by. In the big games, they would cancel the opposition out and all that. This Man United team has got no idea of even how to cancel out Brentford. They haven't got an idea at 1-0 of what do we do with the ball now? Like, keep it. But, Scott, it starts in minute one, and the problems always start in minute one with Man United, and we're still talking about the same things in minute 90 and beyond. So I just think with Eric, it's it's getting to the point of being indefensible. And, you know, just said there with Liverpool coming up, is that you had that brilliant result against Liverpool in the FA Cup, and that was a fantastic energy boost. But then the question was, right, international break, can you come into the Brentford game and show that that's meant something? I think it's completely honest to say that's meant nothing. It was great for the moment. You're in the next round of the FA Cup. You know, you've got uh, a team from the lower league in Coventry. You might get to the FA Cup final. But let's not pretend that any of this is good. It's not good. It's still bad. And Liverpool had a bad day when they came to us the other day. I don't see them coming to Old Trafford as they're chasing the title now and going to have another bad day like that. And this Man United team, Scott, they just... Yes, a lot of these players have got to go and we will maintain that. And we'll talk about that in the summer as we go forward. But I really don't think you can give this manager a ton of money to say, right, we're going to go and give you new players and we've seen what you want to do. So we're going to help you develop that. I don't see any kind of technical aspiration there at all from from Ten Hag set up, and and that's a shame because I think he's a better manager than what we're seeing. Liverpool surely can't be make the same mistake twice within three weeks. Can't be that bad. No, Both and times. they've got some players fit as well. Like they're, they're going to have players come back to fitness, and they've got Salah, and that's what I, I'm scared about. Is that when I look at their best player and our best players, our best players are a joke half the time. And Salah is just a stone cold killer. I think he had something like eight chances in the first half against uh, in the last game. He could have scored a hat trick in the blink of an eye, but he just did. He had a bad shooting day. But I'm worried about that because I think, well, how do you defend Salah? And I think Wamasaka did well in the cup against him. You might have to repeat that. But I don't know, Scott. Like I, you, you tell me, Scott. Like someone who's an advocate of Ten Hag as well. Like you know, what what is Ten Hag actually trying to achieve on a football pitch? Like. I, I don't know. I don't see it. And I think the tactics are brittle. I think this 4-1-4-1 is broken. And he has to identify that it's broken and do something different. But you're running out of time. Who says I'm an advocate? No, I think you've been an advocate over time. Oh, you've I changed have, your mind. I've been. I have been. Of course you have. So I've, have I've, I. Just said, I, I've just said at the top that I can't... I can't but someone who's more balanced about it. That. You're balanced about it, Scott, and I try and be as well. I and mean, we all have our positions, don't we? So, like, I, th I think you know, you're right. I, you've said that now that you kind of you, you, that's indefensible. But we want Eric to succeed, but it's really hard to kind of sit here and say why he deserves to stay in the job, isn't it? It's really, really tough because he is failing to a completely epic level. You drew at Brentford, but it did feel like a defeat. It really, really did because. You were that bad, and it was the performance that made it bad. We'll talk about the Liverpool game on Friday, during yep. Friday's show, but obviously we've got Chelsea, who are epically awful <laughs> as well. Uh, Chelsea versus Man United at Stamford Bridge. Even the reverse game, which United won 2-1. United, they gave up a good few chances in that game, but they 
they pulverized Chelsea that day, which is just really weird to think about. Mm. Um, I, I, what what's going to happen in this one? Who knows? Um, just two really bad football teams at the moment. You know, if but what I will say, if Ten Hag goes and loses at Chelsea and loses to Liverpool, he ain't got much of a chance. You know, so I think man. yeah, I think it might be mm. the decision might be made up whether they trigger it after that game or whether they wait till the end of the season. But I don't even think the FA Cup's going to save him. No, and, and I would they've got to show sure. more aptitude. Yeah, like Ineos's ambition is like they've talked about silverware and stuff, and Jim Ratcliffe's been very, you know, expressive about those things. Obviously, want to win trophies, but the big thing for this project at this moment, just today, is Champions League. They want to be in the Champions League next year. That is where the way they look at the trajectory of this. This is why, Scott, I'm sticking to my five year assessment. I still think you're five years off because you're so far off. You're going to need a lot of new players, get rid of a load of players. You might now need a new manager. There's a lot of things happening there. But I also think when you look at the, the, the kind of directorship now and you look at those people that are in there, okay, Dan Ashworth's not in the building quite yet. Omar Brad is not in the building, but they're all in the building. Let's be honest. They're all doing the jobs already. They're already talking about do you stick with this manager? And one of the reports said after the Brentford game that Ineos were very angry with the Man United players. Well, I just think, well, that's the easiest take in the world, isn't it? I think you look at that and you think, hang on, we're going to invest hundreds of millions in this. We need something different here. This isn't what we want. So Champions League is, is imperative and I don't think we're going to get it, be honest, completely. This team is not good enough to be in the Champions League as it stands. Um, there are other teams playing better. You just said that Chelsea, Scott, I've watched a lot of Chelsea recently. And I think they've got players who are in more form than we are, than our best players. Like, you know, think about the Cole Palmers of the world. You know, they're still scoring goals. Um, th they're a mess as well. But, like, it's good for them to end the season on a high. Like, go and beat Man United and, you know, reverse that that result. I don't feel good about any of it now, Scott. I, I don't look at any of it and think to myself, yeah, that's an opportunity. This team just needs to do better. You just need to do better. And Eric needs to find a way to win these games or to get results or performances. Because that's the only way he keeps his job. As it stands at the moment, he is packing his desk, yeah, and he's just waiting for the phone call. Because I think United will join that that ruckus of for new managers. Because I think they'll be in it. I think they'll be like, hang on, there's six, new man there's six managers out there that people want. Big teams I'm talking about as well. And we would actually quite like one of those managers because they're on the list of elite managers as it stands. And Eric's kind of, I think, damaged his own standing, both at Man United and in Europe. Is that I'm sure he'll have a great career as a coach going forward, but it does feel like the clock is ticking and this is maybe the end of the Eric Ten Hag era at Man United after two years. Do you have a favoured candidate out of that list? It, it depends if you want a kind of like magic candidate or if you want a realistic one. And like, you might still end up more with a with a Potter or a Southgate, though. I think that there's that's a lot of hot air behind those things as well. Some of it, but for me, the coach that I've always admired over a long, long period of time, and I'm talking like five, six, seven, eight years, because I think he's young and he has failed. Obviously, is Nagelsmann. So, like, if you can get Nagelsmann in some capacity, and you 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 give him the project and you sell it to him properly, and you say to him. It, it, he's, he's almost just replacing it Ten Hag like for like in many ways is that I'm not saying he's loads better but I think he's the progressive mind that you need in the same way that City needed a Guardiola like that to go to a next level and Liverpool needed a clock to do that to go to the next level lots of decent coaches out there Scott but I think Nagelsmann is a is potentially a generational coach but you've got to give him the tools and he failed at Bayern Munich and we I think a lot of that was to do that he just he's got quite a big gob and just falls out with people. Whether that will be a problem for Ineos, I don't know. I think Ineos are a bit more open to that than, say, the Glazers. Like, the Glazers didn't like anyone criticising them, and as soon as they did, they sacked them. Um, but I, th I think that Nagelsmann is the best I mean, of what you do, just because of his profile of what you can do. Can you do it in the Premier League, Scott? I don't know. Can't, I can't give you that assurance. But who would you like, Scott, if it was tomorrow? Like, you, you, again, rob the, you rob the name from my... You know, there's even suggestions though that Bayern want him back. Yeah, you know, because they didn't sack him because he was bad. That wasn't why he left. Like it was because they just had a clash, and now they've actually sorted out upstairs at Bayern Munich, and they've they've lost two or three of the directors and have brought in new directors, and they're like, well, we had this guy, Nagelsmann's brilliant, you know, and I, I don't know anyone that's ever worked with him or had an experience with Nagelsmann that has a, a negative, you know, kind of idea about me. He does remind me of Klopp, like a young Klopp, where. He's gregarious and he's, 
he has got a bit of a gob, but he's also got an idea and he's got a philosophy and he knows what he wants to do. So, yo, well, maybe Scott, in the next few weeks, we're going to be doing Nagelsmann in shows between the two of us because I think we both feel that that he's a very good coach. Julian Nagelsmann famously came to Old Trafford and got wallop 5 0 by Ollie's United. I remember it well. So, uh, yeah, I remember I'm sure it well. everyone remembers that. Anyway, uh, that was hilarious, that because it was like Nagelsmann, best coach in Europe, even though he's only. 24 years old or something who's so young <laughs> or whatever but you go there and Ole absolutely schooled him and I remember that day uh, um, his team played that kind of they played a kind of five across midfield and they just didn't work it out that United were going to just go over that midfield and beat them they said this, United just went we're not, we're not playing midfield against you we just go over you and we'll just beat you and they absolutely hammered them that day so um, yeah we'll, we'll give him that one off that was a that was a while ago Right, so Chelsea await on Thursday at Stamford Bridge. We'll do a show on Friday, unpacking that and looking ahead to the Liverpool game. Mm. Uh, but I wonder if Jason spend, Wilcox will be in by then. Who knows? We'll spend the rest of the show talking about Jason Wilcox, who has, you know, I'm looking at updates. There's there's lots going on. Southampton mm. seeming to be kind of what Newcastle are doing in asking for massive compensation. Even though, like while I was while I was away, uh, the Telegraph put uh, Sandra Tonali's uh, ban on the hands of Dan Ashworth. You know, well, this guy should. Oh, it was it. classic. Like oh. There was a lot of it. Hit pieces, as we <laughs> like to call it in the business. <laughs> Funny stuff. Um, but Southampton. Uh, this is a, an update from Ben Jacobs. Mm. Uh, looking for a fee in excess of twelve months of a salary. So that's the sticking point. These clubs who are who have people in senior positions are not going to just roll over for Ineos, and it might cause a bit of a wait. We're seeing that with Ashworth. I yeah. saw last night there was a suggestion that United were unlikely to get him in before the start of next season. I mean, a lot of it is hot air, like you say, Rob. But mm. you know, Barada at least will be in in the summer, so maybe that's one person who can sit at the top and maybe they can wait for everyone else. But Jason Wilcox has obviously uh, issued his resignation, but Southampton want a significant compensation fee for United to go and uh, take him as soon as possible ahead of next season. Coming in as technical director, though, I think it's, it's a case of it will happen. It's just a case of when. It, it, it's definitely going to happen. And, and I think, again, the story being sold of, oh, they want 12 months salary. Well, what's he on at Southampton? 200 grand? Like, like, let's be honest, nothing. So, so like, I think, again, the story sounds it's sensational. Oh, they want 12 months salary. Oh, they're trying to fleece Man United. I don't think they're trying to fleece Man United. I think 200 grand is absolutely fair for a technical director. Given the 200 grand, it's all done. Now, I think the whole thing, that's why, you know, when we did the show about Dan Ashworth and the whole 10 million thing, I was like, well, it doesn't work like that with executives. You don't, you don't, you're not buying an executive. It's just they work for you and they can either resign out of contract. Yeah, you'll be in breach of contract. Then that's something different. You might get sued. But the other way of looking at this is that both Newcastle and Southampton will need to replace those people. So it's in their interest in a way that if they don't want to work for you anymore, just to get rid as quick as you can. Of course, they're all trying to, just eke some pennies out of it. I think the Dan Ashworth thing will get done in the summer. I think that's 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 done. And I think with, with Jason Wilcox, I don't think this will drag on Scott. I think I think United will give up the 200 grand or 150 grand that they might take. They might go to them and say, do you know what? If he's on 200 grand a year, and I don't know if he is, I'm just making that figure up, but most uh, technical directors are, are yes, it's, in it's, that. It is important to say that. You're saying 200 grand quite a lot. We, we don't actually know. We don't know that, We don't know directly, but he's definitely not on more than 200 grand. Like, he's not. Like, no one in that echelon in championship at technical levels are on anything like that. Most technical directors are on about 50 grand in the championship. Yeah, and I can say that for sure. So, the whole thing, I think, when you look at it, and you look... It becomes Really? A lot of them are, yeah, absolutely. I, I know technical director who actually is that a League One team over here, yeah, who's on about 30 grand on League One team. So that's only one division down. So that's it. They, 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 you don't get huge figures unless you're really at the big clubs, like as technical directors and you're a big name. Like you go down the pyramid, like Southampton are, are a decent sized team, Scott, but you think about their budgets, they haven't got budgets to give a technical director 500 grand. Just it's Man United that pay that money. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Not Southampton. So it's most teams in the championship, technical directors are in that echelon or in that ballpark of kind of like you know, even some of the managers are on pretty low wages compared to the players. So 
that's all I'm saying anyway. I'm not I'm not trying to make a point of that. Uh, my point is, is that it's not going to be enough for Man United to go, oh, boo-hoo-hoo, we can't pay this team. Just pay them, like, whatever it is, because it's only going to be a kind of slice of what you need. If it's 200 grand, 300 grand, 400, just pay it. Because it's a small, it's a small fee to get that person into your club. Um, yeah, when it comes to Dan Ashworth, it might be some other complications there. But they Newcastle need to get their t- their their director of football sorted. So I think that that would just correlate when they get when they announce theirs, they'll say to Dan Ashworth, right off you go, give us a cup, few million quid, and that's it, and we'll we'll be happy with that. What's Dan Ashworth on at Newcastle? Do you reckon, Scott? I mean, I'm not gonna. <laughs> I, yeah, not, he, he's, he's not on 10 million a year, is he? He's not on 5 million a year. He really isn't. Then these people are not on that money. You might be at the, like CEO, I think, uh, at Man United at um, uh, Richard Arnold was on something like, is he on about 1.5? And that was the biggest CEO contract in the world. So there you go. So you can, you can, you can measure it up to that. So I think United will get these things done. And then you also think are very confident of getting these things done now. So I don't I don't think anyone's panicking about it at all. I don't think there's any kind of doubt that you've got this management team about to come into place. And then you've got to decide on your coach. The thing that, that the important thing to to know here is there's a lot of uh, hustle and bustle on both sides. You know, mm. clubs acting as if like we're not gonna let you easily take this exactly. person from our our club. Yeah. Especially because they're quite senior people, but the fact that these people have resigned from their jobs and are you effectively put on guard, guard move, you yeah. know, it, it 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 could just be a case of one day you wake up and you see, oh wait, they, mm. they've agreed it, and oh they're going to start July first, June first, or whatever. Gardening leave means it's finished. Like as soon as you got someone goes on gardening leave, they're not coming back. It's the end. Like gardening leave means that you've gone and we just need to sort out your process of leaving. So, yeah, that will be the case, I think. And I think with Jason Wilcox, the fact that he's resigned, like, you can't get anything more like sure than that. Like He's not resigning to go and have holiday. He's resigning because he wants to go to Man United. And I think um, I think he'll be uh, kind of a public face for that as well. If they can get him in the club early, Scott, he'll be at games, of course, quickly. And they'll sit him there and, and they can kind of do that. Can't they say, oh, we're watching the manager, we're watching the team. And... I think as well, Scott, it's quite interesting. Jason Wilcox, Omar Brada, City people. You're going to get a kind of Man City vibe about how they manage behind the scenes with these people because this is what they've been brought up to do. And I think they'll be injecting some of that into the Man United boardroom. Man City, we know how they've done stuff with their managers over time. Yeah, we'll see if there's any other names that are added to this mix. But Jason Wilcox should be on his way in as technical director at some point. You've got a sporting director in Dan Ashworth, who's mm-hmm. earmarked for that, CEO. Omar Barada, you're not for that. And as you say, Rob, they will then decide on who the manager is. Or maybe they're already doing it. Maybe they're looking at how United are playing and thinking, oh, well, this guy I know over here might be a bit better. But, you know, uh, the reason why, Rob, I've been consistent on, like, wanting Ten Hag to have a chance is because I'm so adamant that the clear out of players needs to happen. or The, yeah. the, the cultural issues that have taken over the squad need to be eradicated mm. and i i've always thought that ten Hag has acted in the interest of clearing that up and that that's been one of the reasons why i've been so you know for him but like i say i can't defend the perform the kind of performances that we saw at brentford things need to improve and if he can't improve it there's no justification <laughs> but, yeah yeah, and I'm with you all the way with that because that's exactly how I feel. And I do believe that Man United's decline in 10 years has come from the boardroom. It has come from the Glades. It's been more about their idea about how to build a football club and that's hurt Man United. But as we've said before, Scott, as well, United have had all these Hall of Fame coaches and these different ideas about how to do stuff. And the thing with Eric Ten Hag is that he absolutely wanted to fix the culture at Man United, but there's no way that whatever tactics he's trying to put together now for football matches is working within a culture like the culture still remains that everything is bad so i think that was it with, with, with eric is that if he was showing tactically that he had a grip on these things but say the players just weren't couldn't do it i think we'd be sat here kind of all right we'd be like well do you know what you just need to get rid of these players and bring in new players now that still remains but you can bring in new players and pay them you know pay millions and millions of pounds for these players to play this system, to play four one four one, is this what we're doing now, next year, and the year after, and whatever? No, no. I think the technical director, I think someone like Jason Wilcox, will look at that and be staggered. 
think he'll be looking at this team and saying, well, even with these players, should still be doing something a little bit better than this, surely. Like, come on. You know, so I think that's where we stand with Eric. And it's, I think it's going to be repetitive, Scott, until it's over. Until it's over and then we can kind of have a clean slate and go, right, now we are looking for a new manager. I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if that's the way it goes. He needs to get results now, tomorrow. His next game's come Chelsea. He cannot lose to Chelsea now. You know, he cannot put a poor performance in against Liverpool. Those will be the end of him if his team does that. And how do you set up to stop opponents beating you, Scott? I don't really know. We're just this mad kick and rush team, aren't we? Just play play fast, go mad, transition. That's all we've got. That's all we are. We'll finish up in a second, but I just wanted to mention one other thing. Uh, just in terms of the culture, this is not on the on the order or anything like that. Did you happen to catch uh, Ipswich? Yesterday. Uh, See, look, we've not had this conversation, have we? We've not <laughs> had this conversation. But I thought this, again, in my pre-production notes, I wish I'd written it down. I could have shown it to you there. I'm looking at different coaches. and We can't do a three-hour show on coaches today. But, yeah, the Ipswich. This, this, this talk, talking of culture, this, a guy who was criticised as being absolutely clueless in Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's coaching staff. I'm talking about Kieran McKenna. He's turned... Yeah. Ipswich into massively unlikely championship title contenders. It's a three-way battle for the championship and, they play and a three-way battle for two positions. They play good yeah. football. A unbelievable winner against Southampton on uh, on Easter Monday. And no, we, we talked about this a, f- a few weeks ago. I think this will be a massive long shot, obviously. Mm. But, you know, I think my point here is that just thinking about the culture, how if you escape it, <laughs> it doesn't necessarily mean that you're you're awful. Um, but Kieran McKenna is uh, really pulling up some trees and making a name for himself. As it's yeah, I think he's a he's a really great young coach. Really do we thought that at Man United? Uh, I understand why he wanted to leave in, in those period, and I think you know, it was again another toxic period at Man United. But I never blamed him, and I said a lot of people did. You know, people looked at him and they were like, you know, McKenna and uh, Carrick. Ole, I spoke obviously recently, didn't he, in a podcast where he did with, with Gary Neville and co. And and kind of said, you know, these two young coaches were brilliant for me. They 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 really, you know, they you could see they were going to become managers because of what they did. And they helped him a lot in those in that period. Yeah, I, I wouldn't cross him off the list. I really wouldn't. And and I know again, Man United fans in general would be kind of a bit shocked by that. Like Ipswich's boss, what are you doing? Like there was only a few weeks ago with people going, Jason Wilcox at Southampton. Southampton, what? And you're like, yeah, he's probably one of the highest like rated football directors like in the UK. So that's what they're looking at, you know, trying to bring in a talent. And and I think coaching wise, Scott, that's almost like a reset button, isn't it? If you went and got a, a McKenna, there's less pressure then. It's kind of less pressure. It's kind of like it's not like Nagelsmann out the gate where you'd be like, right, first six months we need to see this. And if you don't get there, then we have to talk about do we sack this manager again and all of this. Someone like McKenna, you could say, right, it's a five year project. We're going to give him two years. Like, we're not even going to blink. We're going to go and buy new players. We're going to get rid of these players. And we're going to bring back someone who will push the culture. Um, it wouldn't get United fans excited, but I wouldn't be wholly against it. Like, I wouldn't. I would. It's something, I think, up for consideration. Because I think you've got to consider everything, Scott. That's the best way to be in business. I'm not saying for a second that that'll happen. But, hey, you know. Um... I've, heard, I've heard little things. Like, there, the pe- there will be people at United do like him and still admire him. They do. And... And and yeah, he's got. They have shown they have shown an aptitude or a desire to just hire. I don't. I hate to say the best in class UK mindset. I'm not calling hmm. Kieran McKenna best in class at all. But if you're talking young coaches, yeah, you know, I haven't had a problem under Ineos of appointing people from clubs in the Championship, like Southampton. In Jason Wilcox's case, other clubs like Newcastle, hmm. who are you know not on. I know they're on their way up, but not yeah. at, historically at United's level. Who worked at Brighton before, you know? Hey, cr- crazy things. No, I'm, yeah. no it no, is no, a little bit crazy. 
you know. 99% of Man United fans didn't have a clue who Omar Barada was beforehand, right? Didn't and, uh, Not a clue at all. And again, I'd say 95% of Man United fans didn't have a clue Dan Ashworth was before. Like, re- being honest, like, I'm talking about the broader spectrum of it. I think when you're looking at coaches, you could go and get a coach from uh, continental Europe or South America who is kind of unknown, but maybe is the next big thing. Do you remember when Chelsea went and got Mourinho? Obviously, they were in that, that point there where, where he was just in that last year had climbed up there. But a year before that, everyone was like, the guy who used to work at Barcelona who was Bobby Robson's translator. What? Do you know what I mean? And and he made that jump to Chelsea and, and successfully made that jump uh, over, and over time and proved it. Obviously, we're winning the Champions League the year before that. But I think when you look at uh, someone like McKenna, is that it kind of does feel like an Ineos fit. Like if Ineos want to take it one step at a time, they might go, well, we don't want to just go and get that manager who's got a big name who's going to placate people. We want a coach that does what we want them to do. And we know that the big boss, Sir Jim Ratcliffe, has already said our coach will do what we tell him to do. He said it already. <laughs> it's out loud. And that's maybe where the Eric Ten Hag thing falls off a bit because I don't really think Eric's doing what they want at the moment. Eric's doing what he's been doing for the last year or two. So, uh, yeah, Kieran McKenna, a, a discussion for another day, definitely. But there's, I think there's going to be so many managers in the mix if Eric does get sacked. Maybe we'll have to do a manager special if uh, the, these results and performances continue. Uh, United play Chelsea on Thursday, Liverpool on Sunday. We'll be back on Friday, though, to unpack the Chelsea results and performance, whatever happens there, and look ahead to what happens at Old Trafford against Liverpool. I mean, we're back in the same position we were before the first Liverpool game in the sense of, like, oh, Randall God, Day. they're going to smash us. And uh, it just never Randall. seems to... Uh, n- n- we're just perennially stuck in this uh you know loop of oh there's a high oh no that's actually god awful this is the worst thing i've ever seen in my life and that's just the way that it is rinse and repeat anyway uh that is it from us today this has been the promise sam podcast the show about united and part of the nightmare podcast network from scott and rob please subscribe to our audio show on apple and spotify give us a five-star review watch us on youtube as well where you can like the stream subscribe and leave a comment and hit the notification bell so you never miss a show. And follow us on social media at double underscore Scott Saunders, at underscore Rob underscore B, and at TPL MUFC. Rob, any final thoughts or words from you? No, 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 just about Chelsea. Like, I am worried about Chelsea. Like, I know they've been so horrible this season, like Chelsea, and they've been, you know, absolutely tangibly worse than us, <laughs> you know, being honest, or looking at the league position. But I actually, watching Chelsea and seeing some of the things that Pochettino is trying to do, like unsuccessfully, obviously, I think they've got a little bit more of an identity and an idea of what they're trying to do than say we have at the moment. Like, and and I do think that at midfield issue at Man United is the key in this game. I do think that Chelsea might be able to exploit that and get through United's midfield a little bit too easily onto our defence, and then that's a problem. I just want to give Andre Nana that shout out though one more time. I think Andre Nana's form in the last few months has really improved, and and we're very lucky that he's had that improvement because I think if he'd had a bad seat, even worse season, Scott, where would we be? Like, I think. You know, we might have conceded another 10 or 12 goals or something like that. And then Eric Ten Hag might not be in a job right now. Hopefully, Andrew and Anna will have another good performance at Stamford Bridge. Yeah, I've just jinxed him now. Thursday, you, might, you might have. You might He's have. just going over a kick into his own goal or something now, isn't it? Or, 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 or he'll try and take on six players in his own box or something like that, get mugged and, and Chelsea will score. This sounds but... echoes of another El Sacico. Remember that between Nuno and uh, was it Oli? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it happens a lot, doesn't it? Because because there's only like four or five managers who are generally safe generally most seasons, and and it's always like you form dips. Like Brentford are in that Scott before the game, you know, talking about um about uh, Thomas Frank, their manager, being linked with Man United. That's a manager who's just lost fourteen out of eighteen. Not happening. But his team did school us on the day. <laughs> a bit like, oh, actually, <laughs> all right. Okay, maybe he's a good manager. And maybe it's just us who are really bad. So I don't know. Yeah, we'll be back. I think if United go and lose to Chelsea in a bad fashion, that's a pretty damning uh, state of affairs. But anyway, we'll be back on Friday. Can I just say one more yeah. extra thing? Go on, one more thing. If you do sack Eric Ten Hag early, it might avoid getting Gareth Southgate. Might not wait. I, I don't think it's going to happen anyway. Man United might not. Man United may, may go, oh, we're going a different route and stuff like that. I know. I'm just having Southgate being on the list because if you wait longer into the summer and then the Euros happen and come and go and all of this, 
you might get a little bit closer to that. And I, I really want Gareth Southgate really as a Man United manager. I think there are other coaches out there. I would prefer Kieran McKenna, being honest. Right. Okay. The Southgate chat started. I'm gonna I'm gonna exit the podcast. <laughs> Uh, right. Sorry, guys. If if the sound's been a little bit off, it's, it's only for today. Uh, but we will be back on Friday with uh, with good sound and hopefully no tears um, after Chelsea beat United. We'll, we'll see. But that is it from us. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. If you've watched us on YouTube as well, please leave a comment on anything we've talked about today. Is Ten Hag ripe for the chopping? Uh, let us know. How do you feel about United at the moment? And uh, until next time, this has been the Promised Land podcast. Thanks, everyone, for listening and watching. And see you soon, very soon, from the Promised Land.